know about it. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today at another Goldmine Project event. Uh, my name is Catherine and I am the president with the Goldmine Project. I've been a part of the group for many years and this year I stepped up into the presidency position. Uh, we also have Marika here today and she is our director of green projects. So she will be helping myself uh, host and facilitate the session today. We have some spectacular guests. Uh, from the oil and gas industry that I'm very excited to introduce to you. Uh, for those of you returning, we are so happy to see you again. And for those that are new to the GMP and maybe found us through Eventbrite or LinkedIn, we are equally excited to have you joining us. And, and we truly hope that you find value in this session today. We should, we should have, you know, we should, this session today should take us to about to a, for about an hour. So we should wrap up here in and around 11 o'clock. Uh, we do ask again that you, you know, please turn on those cameras. It's so much easier presenting to an audience when you can see all their faces. Uh, and again, we do ask that you will turn off your microphone so that there's no background noises, no dogs howling or anything like that, no matter how cute they are. <laughs> um, so yeah, we do ask that you mute yourself. And again, we will be recording this session today and posting it to YouTube. If, for those folks who would like to rewatch and get some more additional details or for those who weren't able to join us today. Um, again, we are a nonprofit organization, so we are totally volunteer run. Um, and so we typically focus on events that are monthly, highlighting local tools for job search and mental health, some local resources, as well as job, uh, job opportunities and industry information. Our focus is helping people who are unemployed, underemployed, or unemployed, or even transitioning in their career. Um, so, you know, before we begin here in the spirit of reconciliation, we would like to acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksisa, Kahani, and Pekani, and the Titsina and Stony Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nation, and for all those who make their home in Calgary, we're living in the Treaty 7 regions of Southern Alberta. And I'll pass it over to Marika here. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so just a few housekeeping items. Catherine actually mentioned most of them already, but uh, today will be an open dialogue. So it's not a presentation uh, format. We're gonna have a bunch of questions for our panel here, and then uh, we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience. But I do ask that you put those questions in the chat box and we'll we'll read from there. <laughs> I can. You can only imagine having so many people <laughs> trying to speak over on these that it, uh, that it can get quite chaotic. So yes, please use the chat box. Uh, again, we will be posting this on the Goldmine Project uh, YouTube, which is just simply the Goldmine Project, where you can see previous events like our last month, uh, Let's Talk Hydrogen. Um, and then, yeah, that's, that's the last for the housekeeping because Catherine, you covered most of them. So as promised, today we have to, uh, Mira Keegan, Ben Kopaki, and Mike Backus, and they'll be chatting with us about their experience on the other side of the interview table. So we have a lot of questions to ask them, but first I'd like to get started with introductions. And so I'm going to put it to you guys to introduce yourselves. Maybe I can start with uh, Mira. Go ahead and just give us a little bit more about your experience in the oil and gas industry and, and on the other side of the table. Hi everyone, my name is Mira Keegan and uh, well, I've been working as a recruiter for um, just a little over eight years, uh, working in the oil and gas industry exclusively for the past six. Um, I've worked uh, in for variety of industries besides oil and gas, uh, agriculture, municipal government, uh, but certainly uh, oil and gas is where I started to specialize, um, hiring from, you know, entry level to executive level type positions and, and everything in between. Fantastic, fantastic. Who wants to go next? Mike? I can go. I can <laughs> oh, go. Perfect. Um, my name is German, <laughs> um, as Catherine probably mentioned. Um, oh. I actually don't. <laughs> I actually don't work in the oil and gas industry at all. Um, I work in real estate, but I did internships at, in the oil and gas industry. Um, at... Oh, okay. Sorry, Mike, if I mean, you, you want to go ahead there. 
<laughs> Sorry, Jeremy, we're, we're talking about the panelists here. Sorry about that. I think you got cut off by our, our automatic muting. But Mike, please, please go ahead and let us know about your experience here in the oil and gas industry. Hey, that's great. Uh, thanks, Rika. Um, Mike Backus, uh, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to join you guys today. Uh, I've spent kind of 25 plus years in the energy industry, mostly with Nexon and then CNOC, which is all became part of the same company. I've worked various roles, levels, kind of had the opportunity to work around the world in a lot of different capacities as well. Uh, and then I joined a small, a uh, couple of years ago, I joined a smaller gas producer and spent a while with them. And then we sold our company to one of the big guys, which is kind of a trend these days. And, uh, and that was just here in the last number of months. So I'm kind of in a bit of a transition myself. So I kind of know what some people are going through, but I've really, and I'll give you some examples because I think this is maybe where you guys might want to think about moving your, your thoughts to as well. But I've really tried to open my mind to new opportunities. I've been working with a lot of startup companies, some in a voluntary capacity and, and a couple on the board level as well. And I'm continuing to look for roles um, that are the good fit for me. So that's sort of been my journey over the, over my career in a nutshell. Wonderful. Love it. All right, Ben. Thank you, Mickey. Um, so Ben Klopaki, I come from, I guess, just over a, a decade on the engineering side of things, predominantly in oil and gas, though I did spend a, a period of time doing alternative energy. Um, I, say recently, but I guess it isn't that recent anymore. In uh, 2019, I left that and did a startup um, with my business partner called WestGen Technologies. We're a, thank you, <laughs> we're a <laughs> clean tech company that's focused on eliminating emissions in the oil and gas sector um, and doing that in a, an economic fashion where we're actually able to keep prices down, keep costs down and, and allow companies to move forward to a, a lower carbon intensity future. Um, that WestGen has had about 400% growth per year um, for the kind of first two and a half years that we've been doing. We've just started moving down into the States um, and, and we're expanding fairly rapidly. Fantastic. I love it. So the best part about this, I, I, I chose these three panelists specifically just from their different experiences in the renewable energy industry on the side of recruiting. So, you know, Ben coming from startup, but also has, you know, a vast experience in oil and gas. Mike coming from a well-established CNOC, huge company in oil and gas, and Mira as a oil and gas recruiter. So uh, first of all, just to kind of get the list lay of the land here, could each of you go through, and it could be very brief, just how you've selected candidates in the past, you know, give us a, just a short version of the process that you use to, uh, to interview even, and then select candidates. We'll start again with Mira. Sure, thanks, Mickey. Um, so I found that any, any clients who typically would work with a, with a recruitment agency, um, they, they typically do that so that the, the recruiter is doing the initial screening. So their hiring process can be a, look a little bit different than companies who are doing it entirely internally. Um, so, so typically they would rely on, on me or one of my associates to screen candidates for um, absolutely the you know, basics in terms of experience, skill sets that they're looking for, and then um, also get an idea of fit, but then once I've determined who has the, the right experience for them, um, then typically they would meet with a designated hiring manager or perhaps you know, usually maybe two at the most uh, hiring managers from the client company who would then screen more around fit. So in terms of whether or not they think that this person has the uh, ability to work with their specific team um, above and beyond the having the basic skill sets, but they were able to then I kind of streamline the process in terms of they didn't have to worry so much about do they have the actual skills to do the job? That was my job to tell them that. They then can just focus on whether or not one, they're good, this person's a good fit for them and whether they're a good fit for that person as well. 
Okay. Okay. So you kind of go through the resume, find technical skills, and then they find yeah. job fit and personality fit. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Okay. Mike. Yeah. Like I think most of my experience, if I can like the traditional way that I would have been exposed to is, you know, your typical submit a resume, get it screened from, you know, whether it's the HR department or like Mira said, if you're going through a search firm, you know, get, get the interview and go through the, the process, basically short list and hopefully you're successful at the end of the day. I think what I wanted to throw out there today is some of the more emerging and innovative approaches that I've seen and experienced, you know, are more use of video, um, whether it's live or pre-recorded for screening of candidates. Some people even proactively put their own kind of bios or videos up, uh, which is, you know, it doesn't work for every role, but it's, it's starting to become, I think, a bit more. Also, putting the candidate in, you know, more social settings, you know, we talked about fit, I think that's so important these days. So sometimes it's, you know, uh, an informal, you know, dinner, lunch, whatever it is is just to get to know the person a little bit better because I think sometimes true colors kind of come out in a more of a social setting and you know I think if you want to really kind of go out there I've, I've actually just recently one of the companies I'm working with they've really I think kind of innovated their interviewing process and they've even turned to some artificial intelligence to help with some of their screening so they've put in questions and maybe even some kind of neat tests that are in part of a screening and some AI actually does some of the screening for them. I'm not suggesting that's necessarily the best approach for all industries or jobs, but it's just to show you that I do think things are emerge or evolving a lot in that space. And it's not necessarily just the traditional approach. So I've seen a lot of different ways and, and I think people just need to kind of be open-minded about these different approaches. Very interesting, very interesting. I have some questions that are gonna kind of be related to that, but first I want to hear Ben and then I'll ask. For sure. Um, so I might split this into like the the identifying candidates and then seeing them through the actual hiring process and seeing where things go. Um, from an identifying standpoint, we've tried both the the recruiter and or canvassing LinkedIn side of things. Um, and then a lot on leveraging our internal internal networks um, and then leveraging the networks of the people we know and and kind of I'm going to throw it in the same category even it's even though it's different um, the people that apply directly into the company or that call into the company and we've had a lot more success with the latter so um, reaching out to to friends friends of friends as far down as we can saying hey who do you know who's out there um, and one of the things I think I'd like to pass on to the, the goldmine people is um, if you're out looking there for work, make sure everybody that you know knows that you're out looking for work. Because I think, especially in Calgary, a lot of people are still doing, especially the smaller companies, the network side of things. And it's because um, when you publicly post applications, uh, we are sorry, publicly post postings we put some stuff on LinkedIn and you get instantaneously flooded. And there are like just hundreds and hundreds of, of resumes come in right away. Um, the recruiting side can help with that a lot. When you're a smaller company, you don't have tens and tens of thousands of dollars to throw at that. So finding ways to, to sift through that and pull out the ideal candidates, um, the network side of things so let people know but also people that come and send an application to us that make an effort that's very tailored to our company and what we're looking for shows us right away that they've taken the time that they're looking for a specific job that they've taken the effort to learn about us and that means that we can put in the effort to learn about them so i think that's a really important thing too um through the actual interview process we've kind of transitioned halfway through the company um, after having a couple of failures, to be honest, in the hiring process. And we follow a method. Uh, there's a book out there. It's called Who, the A Method for Hiring. And sorry, were you saying something, Mickey? Yeah. Oh. 
No, uh, I was just making a note, the A method. I'll send that out to everyone. It's, it's an absolute phenomenal book for understanding the interview process. And one of the things that comes out of it is trying to break through the traditional interviewing questions that everyone has canned responses for. So, um, you know, hey, what sort of challenges do you see yourself facing in this position or what sort of um, what sort of difficulties do you have filling the position? And a canned response would typically be, oh, I don't think I'll have any things that will hold me back from there. Well, that doesn't make you that everybody has challenges. Everybody has problems. So how do you break through that and find out who the person actually is um, and make sure they're aware of themselves and there's challenges and that they're, they're in a growth mindset to try and work with you and, and move forward? Okay, really interesting because my next question was actually going to be for, I guess, all of you, but when you're looking at an, a resume, it seems, Ben, you, you have a, a big importance or you place a high importance on personality and I guess, you know, the fit with the team. And I'd be curious, Mira, because you're looking at things from more of, I guess, an educational and experience point of view. And Mike, you had mentioned potentially like a screening process with AI. What would your guys' thoughts be on how important education is, like your, your level of education versus your experience? So if I was an AI uh, program sifting through sur uh, surveys, sifting through resumes, would I be more focused on your years of experience in a specific role or in the industry or in you know, anything versus level of education? What do you think? To me, that um, so to me, personality and work experience is everything. If you're looking at a, a job straight out of school, yes, we're going to look at education. Um, you know, as a as a technologies company, we'll still and and being an engineer myself, I don't hold a lot of value just to the title engineer. Um, I think that we'd look for a technical background. So whether it's an engineer or a petroleum tech out of state, or, um, I mean, we have electricians and mechanics on our, our team as well. People that show that they can understand a technical concept and that they have the ability to learn, that is important. But beyond that, um, I think of what I know now and what I do now compared to what I was taught in school. And I don't, personally think there's a, a huge correlation between the two. So I think it's your experiences, especially for those senior intermediate level positions, um, your personality, your willingness to learn is the absolute most important thing. Um, and if I had to pick one point that has led us to transition people out of the company um, versus, you know, the absolute rock stars that we have, it's coming in with a willingness to learn um, an understanding that, you know, I, I don't know everything there is to know. I don't think anyone ever knows everything there is to know. And I think there's always room for improvement. We challenge our juniors that are, are coming up to, to push us, to push the leaders and always question everything because you have this entirely new um, set of ways of doing things. They're, they're coming up with brand new ideas. They haven't done it before. And if you're not willing to at least listen and consider and, and give those people credence, then um, to us, that shows you don't have a growth mindset and, and you're probably not a fit. Hey, yeah, super interesting. Mike and Mira, I'd be curious to see if that is different for you guys being in a different uh, work setting. Yeah, no, I, I would agree wholeheartedly with Ben. I think I like kind of look at education as a bit foundational. It's sort of you tick that box and then you move on. And once you're, I always had this mindset, once you're kind of in our industry, call it five years in, you know, some people gauge that as, you know, kind of use the term loosely, but fully qualified. So you've had a couple of roles. You've maybe got your PNG if you're an engineer or whatever it is. So you, it very quickly turns to experiences for me. And I guess the points I would add to the conversation are experience isn't necessarily just deep technical experience in your field. It's very much cross-functional experiences. It's experiences that you've had managing people, managing projects. Like it's, you have to think about that quite broadly. And 
if you're going into an interview, let's say, and you want to talk about those experiences, which I agree with Ben are, are, are way more important as time goes on, think about how you can explain how transferable those are. Because you might not be going into a role that you've had necessarily even experienced and you might be wanting to try something different. We're talking about transition here, whether it's into new companies, new industries, you're going to have to explain why that skill or experience is transferable into a different setting. And so I'd really kind of try and draw on those experiences and think about the transferability aspects. Really good point. Okay. Mira? Yeah, I absolutely agree as well. Um, I think once, obviously you have, you know, professional positions where, you know, you're either a mechanical engineer or you're not. So then it, it's absolutely moving on into how are you going to be a fit? What type of experience do you have? Um, and I think, you know, just a note to people in your job search, this is where sometimes and not always, but aligning yourself with different recruiters, headhunters can be helpful because a lot of times there are jobs that are perhaps not posted or a recruiter will know of opportunities that they can kind of go, for, go to bat for you if they know that there's, you know, potentially they have clients that you would be a good fit for. One of my favorite placements I think that I've ever done wasn't specifically in oil and gas, but it was in agriculture. And I met a fourth class power engineer. I had a client who was always looking for third class power engineers. And so this, this gentleman had come in uh, for an interview. He wasn't actually even interviewing for a specific role. He just wanted to kind of become part of our team of candidates, see if we had any positions you know, down the road that might be a good fit for him. And I knew right away we had a client that was very aligned with the type of professional that he was, the type of work that he wanted to do. So I remember after I met with him, I actually did call them. I said, look, would you meet, meet with this person? I don't know if you have a role for him. I know you're looking for someone with third class, fourth class. They said, sure, send him in because they knew that we had a good relationship. They knew that you know, typically we sent them candidates that they, they ended up hiring. And they actually ended up offering uh, this person a job in the contract saying that he would go ahead and get his third class power engineer, I think within a year or two of working there, just because they knew the fit and his career goals were aligned with the type of people they were looking to have on their team. So, I mean, absolutely, uh, that, that can be an advantage. Hey, wow, yeah, no, that, that's really interesting. And I think we just got a question in there too that we'll touch on after, after this, but I'd be very curious. Now, Ben, you had said that one of the biggest things for your team and bringing on new people is their willingness to learn. So that to me is, is implying that you guys are very happy to train. Now, do you find, Mike, uh, and maybe Mira, maybe this wouldn't be necessarily in your wheelhouse, but do you find, Mike, that it would be the same in larger companies that you guys would be willing to train fully and you'd be happy to bring on somebody that maybe doesn't know everything about a subject? Or would you be more so looking for a specialist in, in a particular topic? Because I'm assuming you also get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of resumes. Would you look for that perfect person that you're never going to have to train? Or do you want to train someone? Yeah, you know, I think it, it might sound kind of weird, but I think it kind of depends on the hiring manager and their beliefs. Because for me personally, like, I don't think you ever stop training. And I think as if I'm looking at an organization, I want to know that I'm going into a company that has that mindset. And I'm not talking about, you know, how is how much is your training budget? And will you send me on these three courses next year? It's about that continuous learning and, and environment where you're going to be given opportunities, whether it's new roles, different projects, like for me, that's how you train and learn. And, you know, it's quite, a, if that's the kind of environment you want to go into, that's a good kind of reverse question for you to ask is to try to get a sense of the culture of the company. And if, if the leader and or the organization has that kind of mindset and that aligns with your values, I think that's a real positive thing. On the flip side, if they don't have a training budget and, and they just want you to come in and hit the ground running, do this specialty job. I mean, that does exist. I, I will, I'll be honest, like there are some roles, especially in bigger companies, let's say you're going into an R&D role and you're going to be, you know, one of those guys with the lab coats on. Well, that's a little bit different than, you know, your more generalist type approach where you're looking for someone who can kind of adapt to the environment. So I do think it's a bit case by case, 
case specific, so to speak. But um, yeah, training is just for me, it's just an ongoing thing, but not necessarily in the formal sense of training. One thing, um, Mira, do you mind if I interrupt for a second, if that's all right? I, I kind of want to respond to what Mike said there, because it really resonated with me on um, the, the case by case basis. And I think there's almost a degree of self screening that should be done um, on the on the part of the interviewee, where when you're going out and you're looking for jobs, if you want it to be a long term job, if you want it to be a fit where you're happy, um, especially now in this industry where there things are starting to pick up, but I still think there's an excess of people compared to the amount of jobs that are out there. Um, you want to find the place that's a fit. And the best way you're going to find that fit is really decide what sort of company you're looking for beforehand. And then when you're in that interview, you're going to either feel a connection or not feel a connection. And, and I think, you know, having worked at some of the, I'm not going to say large companies, but larger companies, and then being in a small startup, I find for startups to succeed, they tend to need to be your small companies to succeed. This generalist attitude that Mike was talking about where there's this culture of in continuously learning. And I will be the first to say, we are not a company where someone that wants to work a standard nine to five would ever be a fit. Um, we work weird hours. We have very flexible working conditions, but we work extra hours. Everyone's wearing a hundred different hats. Um, there's a huge opportunity for growth, but it requires a huge commitment. And if that's the kind of company you want to look for, go look for those startups, look for those smaller companies out there. If you do want to be the person that, um, you know, a nine to five is really your thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. That, that is entirely completely okay. Um, and where you just want to go in, do your job and come home. I, I think the larger companies tend to be, and it's stereotyping, but I think they tend to be a better fit for that. Okay. Yeah. No, I, 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 I think that's really, that's really powerful in that statement as well, because it, it's telling you or telling all of our Goldmine members that you really have to do a lot of self-reflection before going into something. And I know that that can be hard, especially if you're, if you have been on the hunt for a job for several years, you kind of just want to get in somewhere, but you, who knows, you might walk in and five days, five days later, you're more miserable than you were before. Right. And that's just not good for anybody. Right. Um, so I guess we've kind of already answered this question, but it, it kind of is similar. And so I'd just be curious if there's any more comments that either of you would want to make on the how important is team fit versus job fit? I'll leave it open to anybody. I'll shut up because I've been talking a lot, but. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I think the three of us probably have have all landed on it's like absolutely team fit is is going to be the make or break for most people you can have all the experience all the education in the world but if it's not like you said a fit in terms of your work-life balance or you know your your long-term career goals ultimately it's not going to be something long-term for for either side and i'll uh, jump in here for a second because i had a really good question directly answered to me in the chat feed here and it was are you able to provide an example of matching personality or personality fit? And I think what I myself, I am in HR as well. So maybe for us, you know, give us an example of, of how you as a recruiter take a look at that manager and you're like, this person would get along with that person. Maybe, maybe give us an example of how you might do that and, and how somebody could perhaps mirror in an interview, those kinds of things. I'll make a quick comment. Um, I think it'll an somewhat answer that question. I I'll just make one statement, which might be kind of bold, but I've only ever fired someone because they don't fit, not because they aren't nest that they screwed up on a job. So for me, fit is 90 plus percent of the equation. Um, but to maybe answer that question a little bit more specifically, I've gone through, been on both sides of the table where I've interviewed people and I've only met the hiring manager, or maybe sometimes even the HR recruiter. And then I've been on, on the other side where it's been more of a, 
organizational or team type interview where you've met more people, you've got different perspectives, you've tested that fit in many different ways. I made a comment earlier about sometimes getting tested in a social setting is can really kind of, I, I remember being in one, uh, I was interviewing a group of, it was actually new graduates, but they had a bunch of individual ex, um, tests and experiences to test both technical and, and uh, behavioral side of things. And this one guy came out as an absolute rock star. And then they, the last exercise was a group exercise. And he very quickly plummeted to the bottom of the, uh, of the league table. And basically we all looked at each other and said, well, that was unexpected. So for me, you know, testing it with other people's perspectives, sometimes you wanna get the perspective of the people they're gonna be working with and have one-on-one -on -one or group sessions with them. So that's, those are ex examples for me of where you really test that fit. And, and again, it's so important. Um, you don't wanna drag the process out, but you also wanna make it thorough enough that you test fit in every way possible. Well, and I would say too, um, it's, it's almost something as, as tough as it sometimes is to hear, like it's almost something that has to happen naturally, right? Like you don't wanna go into an interview trying to be, you know, what you think the company might think was a good fit, especially if it's not something that maybe aligns with you. Um, as hard as that can be, I understand, especially if you've been, you know, looking for a long time, um, you know, that, that can be tempting, but you also wanna take that opportunity, right? To get to know them and, and get to know if they're going to be a fit for you. Them being a fit for you is just as important. Um, so, I mean, I'd also say, take that time to, you know, interview them a little. When they ask you if you have questions, have questions, find out, you know, ask questions about the team fit if it hasn't, you know, come up directly. If you if you do have concerns, if you have, want, want to know more about who you'll be working with, the types of personalities, those sorts of things. I mean, absolutely, it's your right to find out, to know, to learn, and then that can help you make the decision too. Because I mean, it can also be the other way around where they think it's going to be great. They offer you the job and maybe it's not the job for you, right? Again, you want to make sure that it's going to be something that's that you're going to want to stick around in long-term as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, Ben, did you, sorry. No, um, I was going to echo what Mike said a little bit uh, on his never fired anyone who was a fit. We actually, after a, a couple of mishires, have a policy of hire who, not what now at our company um that is like absolutely above and beyond everything else what we look for is getting that personality match one of the things so i want to go back to what catherine said um or the question that was posed to catherine is personality match does not mean the same kind of person because if you don't have diversity sorry hit my keyboard if you don't have diversity in the workforce um, if you don't have different ways of thinking, you're not going to be a successful company. To me, personality match means if I'm building a team, um, we even use personality profiling tools to find people with uh, complementing skill sets so that are not the same personalities matching introverts with extroverts, detail-oriented people with, with big picture-oriented people. Um, so you can have these different kinds of personalities, but they need to have common values and common passion. And that's one of the things I want to throw out there in the interview to me, when you see someone light up and, and that's something you can't fake when you're in an interview and you're asking questions and you see someone gets really excited about what they're talking about or what they're doing, that's when you know you have a fit. Um, and I don't think that can be faked. Um, to me, that's the biggest alignment is if I'm building a team and we're a clean tech company, so say it's my product development team, and I start asking tech questions about some of the different things we're doing, and I can have three completely different people from different cultures, and they all line up, and they all light up, and they all have the same passion, um, then you know they're going to fit and, and meld well together. Um, so I think that's it's that passion and then aligned values that wind up making someone a fit for the team and not necessarily um, some of the nuances of their personality. Okay, yeah, I really like that. You know, and I just, I was thinking about something as you were talking about that, um, I guess that personality part. 
I remember going into an interview one time and I had, they gave me a three hour, three hour personality test that I had to do afterwards. And what it was doing was breaking down my, what I need for management. So how it essentially breaks down my personality so, so much that they can figure out exactly what kind of management I need in order to succeed. So I would, I would say to the Goldmine members, go out, look online. There's so many of them. Find out what your personality is. And maybe there's a way to match that with different types of, of managers and say, okay, I need a really strong manager or I need more freedom. And if you can know that, then you can at least reiterate that into uh, an interview as well. Can okay, I, I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. Oh, sorry. Finish up. I was just going to jump on something Ben said because it kind of resonated with me. If that's okay. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, he talked about, he used the example of, you can see it when someone lights up when they're answering a question. I think that's a brilliant way to look at it because I've always, you know, you can go into these behavioral interviews and everyone's probably been through them and everyone can prepare for them and you can have the canned answer. But if, a, if an interview is really skilled, they're going to drill down and find out, okay, what did you actually do? And if you can really personalize those examples when you're thinking about preparing for an interview or a conversation with someone, that passion will probably naturally kind of come out. And so I think just keeping that in mind, not thinking about, does this answer sound good, but did, does this answer resonate with me? Is this something I did? Is this something I'm proud of? And can I articulate it in a very passionate way? I think that's what Ben was saying. And that's been my experience for sure. And you as an interviewee can feel that when you're responding. And as an interviewer, you can absolutely pick that up as well. Love that. Yeah. That I think it's it's super important to to go also into a a company that has the values that you would want or in the industry that you want. I mean, so many of us, and I feel like I can speak on behalf of a lot of Carol Garians that we go into a particular industry just because of the money that you can make from it, but maybe that's not always <laughs> what's going to make you light up in an interview. Um, okay, switching gears here a little bit. Now that, I, and I feel like this is constantly changing, and Mira, you probably know this better than anyone, but what what we like to see on resumes is constantly changing. You know, in some places you want to have a photo, some places or some places that they, they want to see what kind of hobbies you have. They want to really get to know you. What for you guys are things that you do like to see on a resume and things that you don't like to see on a resume? Like what are the, the do's and don'ts? I mean, I think the biggest thing is to be very clear about what your experience is um and provide examples of accomplishments from each role rather than just a list of duties that's something that i found really sets sets them apart um the other thing that mike mentioned much earlier on was that a lot of companies are shifting to using um some form of ai uh to handle their initial screening and and so what that means really is that this the software is looking at these resumes and trying to pull out all of these keywords it, to see if they're you know a fit up front for the position and most of the softwares are okay but they're not great at doing that so they they do need human intervention but what i would be worried about in this current job climate because we have such an excess of candidates and you know not as many jobs as there are candidates is that hiring managers are going to become overwhelmed and start relying more and more on this AI, which means your resume needs to be super tailored to what the job description is in order to be picked up. Because there's going to be a lot less, my prediction would be that there's going to be a lot less human intervention if they have a thousand resumes coming in for an administrative assistant, let's say. Um, they're not going to be looking through the AI to make sure that it caught every single resume that was good. If the AI can spit out, you know, 300, 200, 100, however many they trust it to narrow it down, they're just going to be looking at those to start off with um, and, then, and then going from there. So I think tailoring your resume to the job, making sure if you see, you know, key skill sets, key things that they're looking for that you're actually demonstrating in your resume that you have that skill set, where you've done it, when you've done it, how long you've done it for, um, is going to help you get picked up right away and then hopefully get 
some human eyes on it down down the line. I don't even think that it's just the AI side. I agree mm -hmm. like wholeheartedly with what you're you're saying there. But even when it hits the person side, um, the the resume or the cover letter for for me it, there's an investment on both ways if I'm going to make a hiring thing. And this is something I, I certainly didn't pay attention to until I was doing the hiring and the paying um, myself. And I think it gets missed with a lot of candidates is that if I hire you, even if it's only a three month um, trial period, and then you're gone, that's still a massive investment on my side, because I have to put all the resources into training you, it reduces the efficiency of everybody around you, I'm making a huge commitment. So I want to see in the resume, in the cover letter, that you've taken the time to go and look at what my company does and what the specific position is um, before I'm going to consider you for that position. Because mm -hmm. if you can't be bothered to, to tailor that to the position I'm having, I'm not going to risk throwing, you know, 20, 30, $50,000 at you, even if it's only for a couple of months and it's not a fit. Yeah. That's a very good point. Cover letter. Yeah. I just add, I agree with Ben and Mira and their points. I won't um, reiterate those, but what I would add to maybe compliment that is, you know, I, I like to see something, you know, a little bit out there unique. Like if so, don't people sometimes gravitate to think, oh, well, this isn't relevant to that position. So I won't put it on my resume. Well, sometimes the fact that you've spent six months as a a server or we're or gone tree planting or like something that's mm -hmm. kind of unique that shows you're not afraid to take a chance you're not afraid to do something that's you know quote quote unquote beneath you you know just some continuity some you know you can learn so much from different experiences but the bottom line i would say with everything i think that mir and ben and myself said here is make sure it doesn't become that it's so manufactured that your resume is fake because i think there's a bit of a trend to that and I'm thinking more about, you know, kids applying for jobs like medical school applications. Well, everyone has to have 10 volunteer experiences, this, that. So they just go and do that to tick a box. It has to be authentic mm -hmm. and you have to be willing and able to demonstrate that if you do get through the first screening process. So just be careful of that trap as well. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, I'd be curious what you guys would think about this. On a resume, now that we've talked about team fit being such a big a big part of the hiring, would you be opposed or would you maybe like to see a blurb? You know, we always talk about our, our hobbies. I like the hiking and biking and playing guitar. Would you think it would be useful to put in something about your personality? Like I'm fun, outgoing, I'm, you know, you know, describing yourself a little bit more in that on that side of thing that's maybe not necessarily all work related but does speak to your character and whether or not you might be a team fit i think if you can do it in a way that doesn't become cookie cutter and that's the okay. date like that we get a lot of objective statements um at the top of resumes and or whatever they want to call the, the executive summary what they're looking for and every single person that I've ever looked at is hardworking, ambitious. Um, you know, there's three goal oriented, self motivated, um, five or six key words that, that the entire world apparently is. Um, and it, it almost detracts from you because it's so common. So if you can give a blurb about your personality and have it not be something that every other person in the room is going to put I think it would be a good fit I love that hobbies side of things because to me that is a a five second read to give me an insight into who you are are you um do you like adrenaline sports that that's a certain kind of personality um are you into like puzzles and sci-fi stuff or something like that that's a you know board games that's a kind of personality so you can read I think a lot into what kind of person they they are by what they do in their spare time 
And to me, that's what the hobbies part is, is tell me what you do for fun when you're being you and what excites you. And that's going to give me a really good feeling on, on who you are, at least from a screening level. Can I ask Mira a question? Cause she's probably more the expert on the paddle. No offense, Ben, but she probably looks at this stuff more than you and I, but um, <laughs> just taken. kind of along that line, like, is there a, is there a risk that you put too much in a resume that screens your screens you out? Cause I think what you want to do is you want to have enough to catch the attention, but then quickly get yourself in the door so you can show who you are and what you can offer. Is that a fair statement or? Yeah, I would agree. There's definitely a fine balance. And um, I like what you said about being authentic. I think that's the big thing. Anything that you put on your resume, even in terms of those hobbies, like if you say, like like Ben said, you're into adrenaline sports and you're, you're going to lead someone to believe you have that type, a certain type of personality that way, like you need to be able to back it up. Don't say that you, you do something because you've done it once and you think that that's what the company's going to like. Again, you know, be yourself, be prepared to, you know, be real if you're going to put those types of, you know, hobbies and, and, and personality notes on your resume. Um, and then you want to be concise as well. Absolutely. Uh, that's why my, I always say people like to, you know, I've seen so many five page resumes where they've list every single duty that they've done, you know, on every single role. So, you know, every computer program, every, every, you know, task that they, you know, would have day to day, uh, from most jobs, from most hiring managers, most recruiters can can get a sense of what you would do day to day by seeing what your job title was. And, and definitely that's something that you'll delve into in the interview if, if it gets to that point. What I think is much more impactful is telling us what you accomplished in those roles. So, you know, when I was a project manager at company XYZ, I accomplished this project, which did this thing and did this for the company. Information like that is what really helps to screen, you know, really exceptional candidates from perhaps uh, more middle of the road candidates right away. And again, then once you're in the interview, absolutely, you'll need to speak to, you know, what you did day to day, what was, what were your specific responsibilities, you know, tell us about that information. Um, but the resume definitely, you know, keep it concise and, and stick to the highlights. Would be my advice. Love it. Mickey, love it, love I, it. I know we're having a question period after to address most of these um there is one question that popped up that i i almost kind of want to touch on right now because i think it's applicable it says how do you avoid discriminative practices when looking at these um and before i answer that i apologize if i get your name wrong is it alejandra um are, are you referring to the hobbies side of things or are you referring to um to like different like racial discrimination um no i i mainly um asking about yeah i mean it's some part of the hobby but i do find when it comes to the fit um especially personality fit i do find that there is room to be discriminative um, because not everybody will be a good fit but a lot of people will be able to do the job so i find that just focusing on fit is quite limiting because when it comes to fit and personality, I think that once individuals are sort of aware of what kind of culture there is, as long as it's an inviting culture that harbors productivity and efficiency, I do find that fit is not a problem because people, I mean, at least in my experience, and this is how I see working, um, you know, I go into work to perform a professional duty that is in no way related to my personality. <laughs> because if it was I, it would be a completely different situation. So I think that that's where I find that it's, it's kind of a, a gray line it, or like a, a space and room for discriminative, uh, uh, discriminative procedures. Because, you know, even looking at Cesar's uh, question about older people, well, the older generation has different perspective and views that might, you know, that in a in maybe in a personal setting would would be would create not a good fit but they're they're still going to be able to do the job so i find that on some ways certain practices are could could there could be some room so um yeah i'm wondering how you sort of avoid these these and and, and um yeah <laughs> thank you no thank you for the question i might try and give that an answer off the start, because I do think, and, and I saw the conversations on 
on the senior people as well. Um, I can't speak for everyone and I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of discrimination that's still going on out there. I, I, I'm 100% sure of that. I think from a team fit standpoint, it might not be the answer you wanna hear. Um, we do use, I do use those techniques to screen people from a personality standpoint, because I'm, I'm not looking for somebody to come in and just do a professional service and leave. I'm actually looking for somebody that wants to make this part of their life. Um, I'm looking for, to build a family, um, so to speak at the, at the, kind of back end of the company. And sure. the one thing I think I'm so proud of, of, of where we Ben, you got muted there for a quick sec. I did get muted. Am I not supposed to be saying this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how that happened. Um, <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> so, I am the firmest believer. In fact, we are extremely actively in the roles that we're hiring right now, trying to find different cultures, different age ranges, different genders, different, like, um, we, we don't have the diversity we want right now. And to become the best group of thinking people, I think you need the whole range. It doesn't, you need juniors, with seniors, you need men, women, you need anybody that identifies outside of that range. Culturally, you need a mix of cultures in order to be able to have all the best minds come together and get the best solution. That 100% needs to be there. Um, but for certainly for small companies and most of the startups I know, you also need people that are willing to commit to, to being more than than just a nine to five that, that need to be part of this family because it takes so much time and effort out of you. So whether it's a good answer or a bad answer, I do think that we do discriminate on personality and we use the tools we can to discriminate on personality to try and find people that get along well together. There's another question that kind of falls into this. So if Mira and Mike are touching on this as well, there was, do you have any tips for introverts, very nervous people that interview uh, to show a little bit better? The question was exactly to show better than extroverts. So I guess just any tip for tips for introverts while in the interview, meaning if you are going to be looking for personality and if you're shy, maybe you're not able to fully express yourself. There's a really good book. I'm trying to remember the name. I think, I think it's called The Power of Introverts um, or something like that. I'll do a quick Google. Um, I, I'm actually really proud of the number of introverts. We're probably a 50-50 split or at least 60-40, 40% of the people in our company are introverts. Um, I find if you do enough, if your interview can create a comfortable, safe place where people can um, talk about their passions and what excites them. Uh, introverts won't necessarily come into the room and be this massive personality, but you don't always want a massive personality. If I'm looking for an outside sales role, probably. Um, but there are roles are like applications, engineering and product development roles are largely filled with introverts and they seem to love it. And I think that passion can still come out. Um, even if you're nervous in the beginning, I'm, I'm never, some people are terrified of interviews and I'm never going to judge, hire and fire someone based on whether they're nervous in the inside. I'm, I'm looking for that passion. I'm looking for honest answers. Yeah. And I would say, Oh, Catherine just said it. Practice, practice, practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, bug your friends and family, do practice interviews. Um, one of the kind of pros about this day and age is that a lot of the initial interviews and in, at least are being done via video, via phone. Um, take a look at commonly asked interview questions, have notes off to the side. Uh, 
so that, you know, in the moment you don't get nervous and forget, you have a list of, you know, have, have those notes ready. A lot of, you know, interviewers, you know, obviously will have their own questions, but a lot of them are going to be generally along the same lines. So even if, you know, you don't guess the question they're going to ask you exactly, you're probably going to have an answer written down there, or, you know, ready that, that will help. Um, so, so that would be, that would be my advice. And, and absolutely, like Ben said, not everyone is looking for a big personality either to come in, um, be yourself. There's lots of, we need introverts and extroverts at the table. Absolutely. I don't think it hurts to like, say you're in an interview, you know, be open about, you know, like the, like everyone said, who you are. I don't even be direct and say, look, you know, I, my personality, I'm a little bit introverted, but here's how I do, here's what I do to cope with that. Here's how I fit into teams in the past. Give some examples, talk about your attitude, those sorts of things. And to, to Alejandra's question, I think, you know, down the kind of discriminatory line or, or the fit line, you know, I think what I would be looking for is someone who's going to come in and not necessarily be like the leader of the pack and the, and the perfect fit on, you know, right out of the gate, but someone who's not going to be toxic, right? So you, you want to avoid the, the, the toxicity because that just spreads like wildfire. And that's when we, I think when we talk about fit, we're, we're trying to avoid that, not look for someone who's going to be the life of the party. You know, that's not necessarily, so if your personality is not that way, I don't think that's a negative. Just be honest about who you are. Because if the company's looking for someone who is the life of the party and that's not you, it's not, it's not going to work out in the end anyway. So just being honest on the way through, I think is the best way for both sides to do the proper screening. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. And I, I think maybe this next one is, is directed mostly for Mira and then we'll wrap up really quick. Um, so this one is from Paul and he said the hidden job market is incredibly hard to break into for those who are new to Calgary. So we had talked about reaching out to recruiters and kind of mm -hmm. getting into that, that space. Now, how do you do that? Is that just finding recruiters on LinkedIn, messaging them or messaging the recruitment agencies? How can you be sure to kind of get into that, that group? Yeah. And you know what? It can be tough and it can be a bit of a numbers game in a city as big as Calgary. Um, there are hundreds of recruitment firms, um, some more general, some specializing. Um, so, I mean, most of them want you to apply through their websites. They do have their own kind of AI applicant tracking systems that they use. Um, and, you know, some operate in, in a way that they just bring, you know, most people in for initial interviews. And then as they have positions become available, as they know of, know of things that, you know, might be a good fit for you, um, absolutely, then they would engage you. Uh, other firms will work more on a kind of headhunting basis in terms of if they have a position that they, you know, are hiring for that you are a fit for, then they would bring you in. If not, you know, they, they would have you in the database in case other positions came available that, that did, that, that were a fit for you, and then they would interview you at that time. Um, but definitely once you, you know, had those initial general interviews, those can be really a great opportunity to, again, really interview the recruiter, find out what they know about Calgary, the job market, especially ones that work in a specific space, you know, ones that, uh, you know, tech, engineering, anything, you know, any of any space that you're specifically interested in, it can be great to kind of narrow down your agency uh, spread, spread based on that. Um, and then keep trying, right? I mean, that the other thing to remember is, um, you know, keep in touch with them, follow up, you know, let them know I'm still looking, you know, hey, I just got this certification, just passed my CPA exam, you know, they can update your file that way, you know, keep it a better eye on things that might be a good fit for you. Um, but and the other thing, though, to remember is that, you know, they are kind of bound by what their clients are looking for. So at the end of the day, if they don't have positions that are a fit for you, they're, you know, ultimately not going to be able to guarantee that they would find you a job or um, that, you know, you will, will be the successful candidate. But absolutely, it is another tool to have in your toolkit when you're looking. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, yeah. Mara. All right, the very last thing that I will ask of you guys, um, and for those of you who had questions that maybe you didn't quite get the answer that you were looking for, I'm gonna throw this out there and just say, hey, you know what? 
maybe I, I didn't ask you guys in advance to, to have these questions go to you afterwards, but I, I'm going to go in ahead and assume that if there's any questions here, maybe just reach out to Mike, Mira, and Ben and see if they have a, an answer for you afterwards on LinkedIn. Um, but the last question would be, what would be your piece of advice to, to everybody here in the group, whether young or, or more mature, what would be your advice for looking for a job in Calgary? Your last tips or tricks? I would say find what you're passionate for and then do a search for those companies and submit a, a tailored resume and cover cover letter to the, those companies for what you like to do. Um, and you're right, there's a massive hidden job market. So even unsolicited um, applications, especially with the smaller to mid-sized companies, we keep a, I know most companies are size two, keep a, a collection of resumes of people we think are awesome, but we don't have a spot for at the time. So yeah, find what actually excites you. Go send out a bunch of tailored resumes and, and applications to those kind of companies. And I think that will move you farther ahead than shotgunning out a hundred resumes to every company there is. That's for fair. And so I've got one that's kind of coming in that has been asked multiple times. So maybe Mira and Mike, if you can touch on it in your tip and trick is just uh, approaching interviews with people who've been laid off in the pre previous position. Seeing COVID, we all know that many of the people probably in this group, if, if they are unemployed, it's possibly, it's possible that they've been laid off. So is there any, is there any advice to go come with that? Um, sorry, just to clarify advice in terms of how to approach the interview or? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that we, we touched on a few times is just to, to be authentic, be yourself, make sure that, and, and, and like Ben said, make sure that you're applying for positions that you're really passionate about because that's what's going to show in the interview. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. And if, I don't, maybe the question was even from the flip side, if, if you're the interviewer, um, if that's maybe where the question was going as well, I think, you know, everyone goes through, you know, I think some people come out the back end of these things even stronger. So, you know, if you're a really good interviewer, you can look for the good in something like people getting laid off because it's happening quite frequently mm -hmm. and there's lots of reasons for it. So not being afraid to explore that a little bit, I think is good. Um, maybe I'll answer your, your previous question, um, Rick, about just some parting words. But one thing that I don't think, I think Ben alluded to a little bit at the start, but it didn't really come up in the conversation. And I wanted to get a chance to talk about it because I'm a huge believer and it is the power of networking. And I've always kind of, when I've mentored people or whatever, I've always described networking in a few different layers of complexity. and. You know, if you're working in a company and in a team, it's quite easy to network within your own kind of little team environment. <clears throat> and I think that's sort of the, the, the easy kind of layer. If you think about going now across, like within the context of the same company, going cross department, well, that takes a little bit more work, but it's potentially more powerful because you're broadening your network, you're broadening your perspective. And then think about going across the company or across companies you know, again, that's another layer of effort and complexity, but another layer of added value to, you know, how you could kind of market yourself. And then the final layer for me is go outside your industry, build a network. And I'll give a couple of examples here. Go into like volunteer in the community or the nonprofit sector. And I've had some of my best connections and best experiences taking that extra step. Yeah, you have have to research it. Yes, you have to go and find that fit. Yes, you have to get the role, whatever it is in the voluntary capacity, but that networking will pay off and keeping that network alive and genuine will pay off in dividends through your career. So do it with an authentic hat on, but, but it, it has to be a conscious effort and go beyond that little inner circle of the team you've only worked with for the past 20 years. You have to broaden that out. So that's the parting words I would leave is the power of networking. 
That's huge. And we all know that that's really hard to do during COVID. So I really, really encourage everybody here. I know not everybody's name is fully laid out, but reach out to each other on LinkedIn because you know at least you've got one thing in common. Create a network here, maybe create groups, discuss what you've learned here. Maybe we didn't answer all of your questions. I know Vince and Caesar, we probably didn't get to all of the details that you were looking for. I do recommend reaching out to the speakers if you can, if they're okay with that, and other uh, the other participants in the group and just discuss because really right now, not only for our mental health, we need to start reaching out to people and, and get those networks up and alive again, but it's also really good, like Mike said, to for your future in, in job search. So thank you to the three of you. Thank you to everybody who joined us today. Um, I hope that we were able to touch on most of the, the questions that you might have had. And um, without further ado, I wish you a air conditioned day <laughs> and a great, great job search. Best of luck. And um, I guess stay tuned for any future events that we have. But again, thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mira. Thank you, Ben. And I hope, uh, I hope everybody has a great week and a, a happy holiday coming up. Thank Thanks you so much. Everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Advice. Bye, everyone. Thanks for that. And for those of you just leaving, feel free to follow the Goldmine Project on LinkedIn. Check out our website, sign up as a member. We do have an event coming up in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and Prospect Human Services will be joining us, and we'd love to have you. Awesome. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.